Hey, this is Andy Jenkins. Welcome to the podcast. I'm up here in my office. So I'm looking at this, and I think for the last couple weeks I've recorded in the office. I've recorded in the kitchen. I've recorded in the tiny house. Most people, I think they're a little bit more professional than I am because they have real live intro music. I don't. This is just standard that you can get off the internet. And like it's not even a studio. I just keep hopping around with this microphone. Anyway, uh, here's what I want to do today is I'm going to take you another installment of the Coaches series. Now, here's the argument behind that is there are people around us who are really experts. They have a story. They have something in one of the key areas of life. I've listed those all for you before. Let me do it again uh, because I'm, I'm trying to bring you an expert in each of these areas. And if you are one, reach out to me and I'll feature you here. So here, here's the seven key areas of life, I think. And by the way, when you look in the show notes here, you can log in free and sign up for a 21 day challenge that'll take you through these seven areas. So you've got fitness, finance, family, faith. We're going to talk about that today. Your field, which is whatever you do full time, whether that's a career, school, stay at home parent, whatever it is, wherever you put your hand in the plow. And then you also have friends and fun. Today we're going to talk about this idea of faith. And I've got my friend here in the house, in the office that overlooks all these woods, trees. We'll probably even see some deer come by. This is my friend Lance Gilwin. Okay, so Lance has this great story in that, hey, let's just start filling in the details because he's here. <laughs> and so uh, you've, you've been a preacher. Yes, and yes. You, and a insurance sales guy. Yes, yes. Agent. Agent. Agent, agent yes. And what else? Well, I've been about a little bit of everything. <laughs> I've been a teacher. I taught school one year. What kind of school? Believe that or not. Uh, my dad, I grew up, my dad is a, um, he was a high school coach all my life. Okay. And so I grew up playing ball, baseball, football, basketball. If it bounced or you hit it with a racket or a bat yeah, or you did it. I did it because okay. you know, that was my, that's because That's what your dad. dad did, yeah. Yeah, right, right. So I uh, grew up, uh, we went to a small school. He was a, um, he was one of those where he drove the bus, was the coach, was oh, the teacher, everything. principal, a very small school that we grew up in. And so we just followed, you know, after him playing sports all of our life. When he retired from the public school system, he got a headmaster job at a private school. Okay, well, so I've noticed that's kind of like, that's the difference there is that title. <laughs> yes. if, if it's if it's principal, you just about know yes. that's public school. That's public school. But, yes. <laughs> but they, they Headmaster. It, headmaster, you know. <laughs> Private school. People pay to go there. <laughs> so, right, okay, that's a whole other. Yes. Okay, yes. so, so the, the headmaster. He's the headmaster. And so his first year, Coosa Valley Academy in yeah. Harpersville, Alabama, he became headmaster. The day school started, uh, his teacher got a public uh, pay, a higher pay. The public school pays higher than the private school where he was at. And uh, the math teacher for the year on the first day of school got a public job offered and left, and he didn't have a math teacher. Okay. And so I was a math major in college and have enough hours. Did you even have the credential to teach? Or no, they just no, slide no. you in there. But by law, I could do one year of teaching. Okay, you got a freebie, yeah. Yes. So I was hired on the spot that day. I went from not having a job, waking up that morning, and my dad's like, get dressed, you're going to school, you're working today. And I became a high school teacher. That was just nepotism. Yeah. That's where you get something because of your dad. That was, <laughs> yes. It paid $800 a month. It was great. <laughs> I mean, that's not necessarily high pay. Usually, usually nepotism is like you get something. It's more than I get right now. So you, you get know. something way more valuable than that, right? right, right. You get more than $800. Right. It was a, it was a big time life experience. Uh, I highly respect teachers. I actually love, love that. Yeah, and uh, loved loved helping students, and it really changed my life during that that one year. You know, I started out very nervous that first year, just started activating something new, and uh, by the end of the year, it uh, it, it touched my heart. Uh, I fell in love with the students. I fell in love with helping people, and it impacted my life to this day. And so, um, I just believe, uh, you know, we, we live by faith, and uh, God's always doing a new thing in our life. 
And if you're not willing to adapt for something new, uh, you're never, you know, you're growing and adapting as life comes. You know, COVID-19 just hit us pretty hard. If you didn't learn to adapt during this time, you... you I don't you, know if you, COVID hit us or politicians hit us. <laughs> well, a little bit I'm, of still, I'm still trying to decide. <laughs> well, Not saying it wasn't a real virus, but I, I'm right. still... Well, I had it. It was pretty real to me. I can, I can say that. We went on vacation down to... My, my parents live in Orange Beach, Alabama. My father-in-law lives in Gulf Shores, so they're 10 miles apart. Yeah. We were down there, and I got covid during this time. While you're down there vacation. at the beach. Yes, and it's, it was very real to me because it knocked me out the whole week. Yeah. And I went into quarantine. I mean, I I felt the effects of it. I've had the flu all my life, but this was something different. Very real to me. Shut me down four or five days, but I came through it. Amen. And so um, it was something that I had to go through. It was a different experience during that time. And so when I hear people kind of say COVID is not really real, I'm saying, yes, it's pretty real to me. because Yeah, it was you, real. I, I, yeah. anyway, I well, don't, yeah. Once you have it, yes. But wherever it came from, you know, man-made, whatever, glory to God. It's just, uh, I believe by grace we can do all things through Christ gives us strength. And there's nothing impossible to those who believe. And so... All That's right. where I live my life. So here's here's what I want to talk. Because you, you've, you've said a few phrases now that, like, automatically. Now, some people that listen here don't have a church background right. or don't go. Which, you know, I do have that background. And so I automatically pick up on a couple phrases that you've said yes. where I go, oh, he's he's Pentecostal. <laughs> he's going to get wound up and start spouting. And, and, this, and this is not a slam on Pentecostal mm-hmm. stuff at all. Um, you know, in fact, I, I think sometimes I kind of tiptoe through some of those lines to where when, I, when I'm at a Baptist church or speaking at a church like that, right. uh, those guys, they, they tend to not like my stance on some things because I'm more open to some of the, I've got more in common with Pentecostal people. Right. Um, but, but then when I go to a Pentecostal church and like put some order in on some things, yes. they'll be like, oh, well, you're just being Baptist. And I'm like, well, you, I'm offending both of you. So, but so I know both those yes. camps very well, and have picked up on some. And this is what I want to talk about today well, as part good. of your story because people have this illusion. I think that Pentecostalism is like spirit. So let's just right. use that. It's all about the Holy Spirit. That that's necessarily a free freedom church. Correct. Like that's the freest kind of church you can get into. Right. But. I, I mean, like, as we start really thinking about what they really do and think and believe, and this is no slam on any church. Amen. This is just kind of the theology of it. Right. Um, that can also be very free, and it can also be one of the places where you have to earn and work and strive Come on. the most. And that's what I want to talk about with this whole faith thing, is because i got a lot of people in the area of faith that really think faith is this thing that you have to work and earn. Right. And... Uh, maybe we should talk a little bit about your story and go to some you. of that stuff. Yes, Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, of course, you know the Bible, a little bit of the Bible. You know, we're all we are all given a measure of faith already, and so to, you know, there's you got the word of faith count that works the word to get God to do things. Well, they, yeah, they make right? confessing and saying certain <laughs> yes, things yes. the labor that you do. Right. And and I even, I mean, when I was little, now this was a Baptist thing. You have to say the prayer of salvation in the Baptist camp. Right. right. And and, I, and I, there's elements of great truth in all of these traditions. So I'm not saying that's even a bad thing to say this prayer. Right. I am saying I kept saying it and re-saying it and stating it again to make sure I got the words out. Because if I didn't say it just right, you know, and then if you don't pray just right, at the end of the prayer, I added Jesus' name, you know, or, or wait, hold on, did I leave something out or do I have unconfessed sin so you won't hear my prayer? Like, it can, like, it becomes this work or you didn't believe hard enough. And I, I've even had friends that were in high school where somebody in the family got sick and then died. Yes. And everybody's like, it's because y'all didn't believe enough. You didn't have enough faith. You blame them yeah. because they didn't What's pray wrong right. with you? You didn't have enough faith to believe that. So it's your fault. It's not God's fault. It's your fault, right? So I don't believe that. I don't no, believe I, that. I don't either. But yes. I'm like, but people put that burden on people. Big time. Big time. I mean, I guarantee there's somebody listening that's going, oh, oh, right. what? That's not my fault? You know, right. No, it's not your fault. Amen. Amen. 
Yes, I have, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my background. I was raised in a Methodist church. You know, the different, real difference between Methodist and Baptist. Methodists will sprinkle on the head for baptism. And, and you Baptist know, Baptists will dunk you. Yeah, very you common words. theology, yeah. Yes, you know, and, you know, of course, uh, in my study of the scriptures. And there are some amazing Baptist churches and some incredible yes, Methodist churches. Right. We're all God's chosen people. We're all God's children. And, um you know, whatever background we come from, whatever nation we come from, whatever color, creed we may be, I, I believe we're all the same in the spirit. And I believe when we really break it down and see, you know, the, the word of God says God is spirit. And those who worship God in the spirit and in truth, you know, they should begin to understand some more things. And I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit is, what, is, is what's been given to us. He has been given to us as the things that Jesus Christ has paid for, which is the redemption of mankind's sin, and our faith in him and him alone and Christ alone. And that's where you get into, into the gospel of grace. And that's I know that's one topic that we're going to probably dive into a little bit. And there's different views of grace, of course, with different aspects of, you know, how you think about that or whatever. Yeah. All right, so you're jumping ahead, though, because you're, you're, you're in the Methodist church. Yes. I, I was raised Methodist, a very small background Methodist church. It was only, you know, back back in um, very small. Uh, if we had 20 people, it was only four or five families. Is it a church where they put the uh, hymnal number Hymn on big. the wall? And no, they... not on the wall. No, we had the big hymnal, red hymnal book. No, no, no. Like they put the number of the songs on the wall and then they put like the amount of the offering on the wall and how many yes, people attended on the wall. we had the little thing you got, like, on the a wall. Scoreboard. Attendance yeah. and the slide. Yeah, you know, it's the slide. A, yeah. Yes. Some people are going, what is the scoreboard? Right, how many come people, on. How many people? Oh, if we, nickels, got, double, if we got double and, digits, man. No, nickels Ooh. and noses. How much money? <laughs> Gave, how many people? Oh, yes. Butts and bucks. Okay. You saw it. They all. got the school every board. Every okay. week it was put up there. And if you're listening and don't know what that means, no big deal. You're no, not missing no, anything. You didn't miss anything at all. You didn't miss much. <laughs> so, especially at the. Yes. Yeah, okay. The church that I grew up in, is that I mean, it, was, it was one of the most beautiful churches. It was all wood on the inside. So beautiful. So beautiful, so much that wasp would 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 make a nest in the top. At one time, you thought I got Pentecostal in a Methodist church because, as I was sitting down on the front row, which my parents always set us on the front row, right, and these wasps went up my pants leg. Oh yeah, and they started popping me, and I I, I got very Pentecostal. <laughs> They thought you got slain in the spirit. I was like, you're running. I was running. This is from a wasp. <laughs> it was, I, was getting, I was getting stung three or four times and literally did a strip dance in front of the whole church because, you know, I had to take my, <laughs> I, had to, I had to strip it down, brother. That's the next level. <laughs> that's, yes. They didn't know what happened, but yes, that's a fond memory that I have there. I have many memories growing up in, in the small country Methodist church. And that's when, you know, at, at 12 years of age, as our pastor was preaching, which he was about, I think he was about 99 years old, and we didn't even call him pastor, we called him brother, you know, in our little church. We never even addressed him as pastor, he was Brother Snyder. I mean, that's what they do at a lot of those. Yes. Ba Baptist people do that too. Yes. I mean, I think the difference was, you said y'all sat on the front row, <laughs> and the Baptists, they all sit on the back, back row. Back row Baptist. Yeah, so that's yes. a little bit of a difference too, but, yeah, yeah, they, right. but they do all call each other brother. Brother. Yes, and everybody's so brother. And so. hey, we're brother. brother. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And the highlight, you know, for me as a little kid was I got I got gum for this, this elderly lady. I always gave us chewing gum all the time. I guess he does, because the Methodist church has an altar call like the Baptist church. Yes, they did, but not really at our church, you know, because everybody was pretty much all, all saved. Everybody all knows. We family. We just, okay, we just so. immediate family. I'm talking about there's four or five families. That's it, right? Okay. Now, we did do something different than what I, you know, that we did a thing called Sunday school, which means the kids go to Sunday school class before the main service. Yeah, we did that. Yeah, so my mother. It's like a pre-church. Like a pre-church, <laughs> yes, for kids, mainly yeah. for kids, which they had a little adult class, but, you know, I never really made it to that part yet. <laughs> Up to that class. My aunt was a Sunday school teacher for me, then my mom. Then we upgraded, we got upgraded, you know, as we got older, to my Uncle Scooter. That's what his name is, Scooter, right? Okay. <laughs> Amen. So, you know, during the Sunday school classes, they just talked about the stories of the Bible. Noah's Ark, we learned all about the stories of the Bible. Abraham and Sarah 
and all the characters of the Bible. And then they'd also talk about the rapture of the church, which I don't think anybody really understood, but it scared the living. You know, I thought, you know, i got to get my life right here. I need to get saved. Yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah, I, that, I, I got the hell scared out of me a few times yes. by the, literally, by the rapture talk. Yes, yes. You know, I thought I missed, I thought the rapture happened one time. I had too. I panicked, started calling like the church phone number and calling people I knew who were Christians because if I thought if I get any of them on the line yes. and they got, quote, left behind, oh, that yes. means I probably didn't oh, I get left behind. Yeah, I thought I was left behind multiple times. I'll tell times. you what happened. I was 12 years old and Brother Snyder's up preaching in the middle of his message, which I really don't think anybody ever understood what he was saying. He's like 90-something years old. He just mumbled. But we respected him, you know. He, We were going to let him do his thing until... He moved on into the glory, right? <laughs> and that's how our church went. So during his uh, speech, sermon, whatever he was given that day, I said, I need to get saved quick because there's no telling when this rapture could happen. It could happen any minute now. So in the middle of his sermon, I just went up and tugged him on the on his jacket. Oh, because you thought it could happen even during, I touched, his, uh, during the service. I touched his garment, the bottom of his jacket, and stopped him from, you know, in the middle of his sermon, I said, Brother Snyder, I need to get saved, and I need to get saved right now. I don't have time to wait for you to I don't know how long you're going to take today. So he ended up praying for me. And, oh, gosh, uh, in front of everybody. In front of the old church, which they all said, praise God, you know, and stuff like that. And I, got, I considered myself at that time. I got saved. I gave my life to Jesus. He repeated, I repeated a prayer. He told me to repeat. Felt pretty good about it, you know. What too long after that, um, you know, all hell broke loose in my family, to be honest. My parents started arguing. My parents told me they were going to go through a divorce. And uh, this Jesus character that I just gave my life to didn't seem to be so okay with me. It seemed like the moment I gave my life to him, it's like the devil might have, you know, first time ever. I, I might have gotten bills <laughs> above his head. I said, man, I don't know what happened here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I gave my life to him, and the, the devil shows up, you know, so... It, it was just a crazy time. I'm 12 years old, and you know I'm going through, you know, times as you know as a 12 year old boy, you're going yeah. through many changes. Yeah, that's life. a hard season anyway. It's tough, man. It's tough. Yeah, and so I was experiencing different things, and you know, um, I was always you know hearing these stories about the rapture of the church and hell and fire and brimstone, and that constantly stayed you know in my thoughts all the time, and literally my my family's not doing good at the time. I, my dad's working a summer job. My mom's, she's a life insurance agent. So I'm the oldest boy of, of three boys that grew up in. I got two younger brothers. We're all three years apart. I'm the oldest. And so during the day, I was like the, I would stay home. I was in charge of my two younger brothers. They would let me take my bicycle up to the store, gave me a little money to get us a little candy and stuff and come back home, Right. So I went up there one time and I bought some Jolly Ranchers, you know, I had enough money to get me a few Jolly Ranchers. And I thought it'd be a great idea, you know, Jolly Ranchers, there's all these different flavors and colors in there. I would uh, take a few of them up and pay for them with the man and I would tell the man at the store, I want to trade in this color for a, for a different color, is that okay? He, he said yes. So what I did, I just cupped them in my hand, act like I put them one of them back, and I grab a few more. I got me a little extra. Oh, you're stealing job Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, my life's crazy, you know. And so I got me a few extra. I thought, oh, that's a pretty good idea. That's what I did, you know. I'm a thief already, right? And so I'm, I'm in my bicycle. I'm on my way home. I get there. And uh, it's time that my parents and everybody be back home and stuff. Well, I go in. I cannot find my brothers. Nobody's at home. And I see where my mom work clothes, you know, as she came in, she left her clothes laying on the floor. Oh, I you said, thought she vanished like you got I thought everybody up. vanished. Yes, my brothers are not there. My my dad's usually home at this time because and my mom's supposed to be there and I see her you know, her work clothes and stuff laying on the floor there. Because that's how they do it in the movies. Like, when they're left behind, the people always leave their clothes behind. Bro, all I Like, can... everybody in heaven is naked. Everybody was gone. Yeah. My brothers okay. are gone. My, my mom's car is in the yard. My dad's vehicle's in the yard. That's a weird They're setup. They're supposed to be home. And I go in, and the rapture happened. I'm left because I stole Jolly Ranchers. I mean, I'm tore up, man. I'm running around the house. I run outside and look around the neighborhood. It's empty. I was like, they're all gone. I stole these Jolly Ranchers. <laughs> and I'm left behind. Here comes the Antichrist or something to get me. Put your I work with the beast. And... Brother, 
I decided I'm going to take these Jolly Ranchers back to the store. At least maybe I can make redemption. Who knows? Got to have favor on me or something. I ride all the way back to the store, and the man's, you know, in there. I run in, and I tell him, oh, everybody's left. <laughs> <laughs> he don't know what I'm saying. I was like, the whole world's gone. Don't you know? We got left behind. <laughs> He's like, what? Are you okay, son? <laughs> I said, I stole these Jolly Ranchers. <laughs> Here they are. You can have them back. And I'm well in crime, man. I broke down. This this man comes behind the you know behind the counter there in, in his little store. The name of that store was called Snowy's. I'll never forget it. You know, he's trying to calm me down. I'm I, I mean I'm I'm well in crime. I said my parents are gone, my brothers are gone. They're up with Jesus. And you and I said, sir, you must be a you must be a heathen. <laughs> me and you are got left behind. What'd you do wrong? He's like, Lance, you know, it's going to be okay. He's trying to, you know, yeah. it's okay. No, no, no you're, you're just so misunderstood. And he was all upset. He put my bicycle in the back of his truck and he drove me home. And I found out all my family was at the neighbor's house behind their, you know, in their little carport eating homemade ice cream. <laughs> oh. With all the neighborhood. And, you know, he has he brings me over there and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of messed up or whatever. You know, and it's really at that time where I, I found grace. I really, I really didn't know it at the time, but grace was already being activated in my life because the man that uh, brought me home, he went back to his store and it wasn't long after that, he brought me a whole box of Jolly Ranchers, like the whole container and he brought it to me and he gave it to me for free. And he said, son, I want you to know you can, you can have as many as you want whenever you come in. And I was like, I didn't earn that. You know, I stole from you. But he was even giving you more. He gave me an entire than what you could even possibly un, steal. Unopened box of of a, a whole thing of Jolly Ranchers, and he gave them to me. And my dad, I remember, was like, "No, no, no, he did wrong," and you know, I was in trouble also because of what I did. Because yeah. I, I confess, not by my, own, you know, not like I was trying to confess. You got scared, yeah. I was going to hell, so you know. <laughs> I but, mean, but I think that's one of the big things of grace that people miss is grace is not just mm. more powerful than what you could earn if you right. went and worked and paid for it. Come on. I mean, grace is bigger than what you could get if you just went and grabbed and took all you could for free. Yes. It's, it's a whole nother <sighs> element to it. Uh, yes. But even though we see that when we're younger, and even though, and, and it's weird because like, like Jesus, you know, I was looking at this little video I've got on here for the Soul Wholeness Workshop that's on my website. Um, I'll toss a link in the show notes. And there's a video in there where I talk about, in the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> Jesus talks about seeking. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. And so in that context, he's talking about Matthew 6. Matthew 6, he, He's talking about, don't worry about what you'll wear. Don't worry about what you'll eat. Don't worry about the things that you need, the, the shelter. On. He says, after these, all the people of the world seek, but you seek the kingdom of God. And I always thought Jesus was just kind of comparing, saying, some people seek this stuff. Right. You should seek something different. Right. But it's he's not just juxtaposing what you seek. Those two words in the Greek language are two different words entirely. Mm. So the, the first word about what the the phrase in the English translation is, the Gentiles seek what they'll wear, what they'll eat, where they'll live. All the stuff people are concerned about. And even if they have enough to eat, they're worried about, is it organic or processed? Or right. even if they have enough to wear, well, is this like the in fashion or is that, you know, <laughs> even if it's a place to live, well, it's now we got to have a better place. Seek. Everybody, that word seek cool. is not just look. It is strive, labor, hustle, toil, people work really hard for it. Right. But Jesus is not saying you work really hard for the kingdom. That word seek, Ooh. but you seek the kingdom, is a hunger, a desire, a yes. yearn. Thirst. So don't, you know, chase and struggle and strive for all this. Just yearn, thirst, hunger for the kingdom. Woo, that's good. That's completely different. Completely different. And, and he keeps drawing us, even in that same sermon, to this idea that if you being, <laughs> he actually used this phrase, if you being as evil as you are, right? which we would all get it. We're like, yeah, I mean, we still Jolly yep. Ranchers. Yep. We're we, all sick. We cheat on our taxes. <laughs> we lie about, you know, this thing or that thing or spend things to look better. 
that goes, if you being evil know how to treat your kids well, wow. which we all do. Right. We want the best one. I mean, like even even as jacked up as we can get. <laughs> we care. I mean, we'll still look out for the kids, right? <laughs> that's right. That's, that's because, our, kid. They're our kids. Because if you be evil, know how to take care of the how much more will your heavenly how father much take care of you? More. But but it keeps drawing us to that parallel. Like, you know, so so with with these kids and these adult relationships, you should see a glimpse yes. of the heart of the father. Yes. And so often people want to do it the other way around and go, well. Fathers suck, and fathers. Most fathers I know are pretty good. They're imperfect, but they're right, right. pretty darn good. Right. And and I think they're good because they show you. I mean, God's not the father in our image. We're fathers yes. in His image. So like we're showing an imperfect picture of what oh. He does. And so when you have guys like the store owner at Snowy's oh. that says, oh. "Dude, you can't work hard enough for Jolly Ranchers. You can't steal enough." Right. Even if I brought you in here and said, empty your, like, <laughs> empty the bucket, put it in your pockets, fill them up. He goes, you still couldn't carry out as much as I could just bring and deliver. Yes. He gave me unlimited access to as many as I wanted or desired, and he just gave them to me. And that's hard to understand. That's hard to comprehend. It was hard for my dad to let him give them to me. Yeah, I mean, because, and rightfully so, because grace is scandalous. Yes. He's like, my son does not deserve these box of Jolly Ranchers. However, this man was relentless on letting me have them. And he was not gonna get he was not gonna let go until I had them. We we look at the people Woo! Jesus is around. I mean, he would have been hanging out with people who steal Jolly Ranchers. Mm-hmm. I mean, like he's hanging out with or, or, or I wouldn't say hanging yeah. out. The people who felt comfortable approaching him and following near yes. him were people who were caught in the act of adultery. Oh, like the woman. People, prostitutes. People, yes. It was tax collectors. Yes. It was like the more unruly you were, right. you felt more comfortable with him. And, and the Pharisees kept asking questions like, why, why do you dine with him? Like, right. why do you... Come on. And, and I think in their mind, they felt... In that culture, whenever you dined with someone, it, it wasn't just like eating. Like, you're pro- pledging your life to them. It was, right. I've got your back, you have mine. Like, there was all this imagery yes. and relational value associated with the act of eating. And I think the Pharisees were over and over upset. That's the context of the whole prodigal son story in Luke 15. Why do you dine with them? In their mind, Ro- Rome occupied Palestine where they lived. Right. And they are falling behind culturally because they had sinned. Moses had told them right. when they went into the promised land that if they sinned, they would be kicked out hmm. or they would be slaves or they would be second. Or they would be occupied. They would have other people warlording over them. And their history proved that that was true. Because they had gone into exile, the Babylonian exile, the temple right. had been burnt, destroyed, and Did now Moses ever get in the Promised Land. No, no he I saw it from afar, yeah. but come he told on, them. Come on, come and on, so come on. they had lived talking. enough history to where they saw that seemed to be true. And so when Jesus is hanging out with people who are sinning, blatantly sinning, right. tax collecting, prostituting themselves, come on. they are thieves. They are when he is. I mean, in the whole, like the <laughs> phrase they use is. He hangs out with tax collectors and sinners. Like that's the ju- <laughs> that's just kind of the junk drawer of sin. That's like <laughs> like they don't they don't list all the big ones: fornication, lying, lewdness. It's just right. like tax collectors and sinners. That's, <laughs> so when he's hanging out with them, it seems like he's endorsing what they're doing, and so he's creating a situation because of his grace where God is less likely to be able to show up and bless the people right. in their mind. But they're missing the fact that God is walking right among them right. in the flesh. Literally. It was literally flesh. right there. Right. That's the that's how you test the spirits, actually, to say that God God came in the flesh. God became a man. He became a new man. You know. The Bible says, you know, from the first Adam we're all imputed or accounted as unrighteous or not right standing with God. But in the last Adam, who is Jesus? Who's Jesus? The new man starts a new line of a new line people. Of, yes, brand new, exactly a new man, and because he was not born from 
He was born different. He didn't come from. He, he his daddy was Jehovah. It was right. not a not a not a man. Joseph, who's that baby's daddy? It wasn't Joseph. It, it was it was God, and so God manifested a new man in Jesus, different from the first Adam. And the Bible says, by the last Adam and the things that he completed and did, by the last Adam were all now imputed righteousness, righteousness right standing with God. So now, isn't it weird Ooh. then? That, I mean, the position that we occupy now is like the Jolly Rancher <laughs> right. gifted version of yourself. Yes. Where someone has acknowledged the sin, right. has acknowledged the wrong, said, hey, look, I'm going to give you everything that you need and more. So we, we, come on. And we have that image of the father who says, hey, look, yes, you, you, you know, you being evil, know how to take care of your kids. I got you. I'm going to take care of you. Hunger, fun. thirst, yearn for it. Don't strive for it. Don't hustle. But yet, then when we get into adulthood, Ooh. the first thing we do is start doing what the Pharisees did. Right. And we start trying to earn it or prove right. it. Or you know, you know, to me, what the greatest, like, I, I call it the unseen miracle, is that when Jesus walked amongst the Pharisees, Sadducees, those chosen God's chosen people, yeah. the Jews, and he did mighty miracles. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out devils in front of them. You know, the, the story when then he was in the house where they were so, so crowded that they tore the, tore roof, the roof off, off. And, and, and brought their friend down, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. That's the first thing he said, and that kind of wrecked them. It was like, wait, wait. We can understand seeing the miracles, but you're saying that you are the Messiah, and that's what they were bothered with. Even though he manifested many miracles in front of their sight, and they were looking for their Messiah, that their whole life living under the law of Moses, being obedient to sacrifice, all the animals and the sacrifices for the atonement of their sins. was Well, they're the tithing their mint and cumin. <laughs> yes. they're, they're tithing their spice rack. Yes. I mean, they're like keeping the yes. rules. Yes. And there's probably something to where they were like, we get to feel God will bless me right. in their mind because I'm so blessable. Come on. In our mind, often God won't <laughs> bless me because because I know what I did. That's I'm right. not bless. That's I'm right. not blessable. Right. Right. That's so you're saying they're looking. seeing the Messiah and right. they're keeping you know, you, all these rules to be yes. blessable. You have the law of Moses that you know that God has given us, and they think that's to live by for their salvation. But you know the the real mystery of that is that it wasn't given to them to to obtain their salvation. The law of Moses was given to them to show them that they are imperfect, that no man can obtain such a perfected law. It's very difficult. I mean, there's more than just the Ten Commandments. There's you know there's a whole lot more, six hundred thirteen of them. Well, and then they kept adding on commentary and, add, and, and commentary add, and, add. and commentary. Yes, yes. And okay, so take me take me to this in your own story. Because we're talking right. about the Pharisees and all that. They're trying to earn it. Right, um, right. And, you know, we kind of start off with Pentecostalism and all of that. Right. We kind of You can kind of <laughs> earn it with the words uh, or with faith. And, yeah, I mean, and again, we're kind of being very generic about different sects and denominations and that sort of thing. But Right, right. We, we were we started there and then we went to the Methodist Church and kind of got on the story your story right I got saved and I, I missed Methodist the rapture Church. but then got you know then I found out everybody's still okay back to living life again right yeah, yeah. so obviously right. we have to skip a lot of the story but Boom. where yes. does where does like Pentecostalism and all of that I came come back into in? Pentecost when I was in college I met this guy I, I got a scholarship to play tennis. Long story short, uh, a roommate of mine that I became a roommate with, he, he his dad was a pastor of. Were you good? At, I guess you were good at tennis if you got well, a scholarship. Well, I played every sport in the world, you know. Because I mean, he, he looks like a. Uh, <laughs> you play football or rugby? No rugby. Right. Oh no. No, that's rugby. what I'm saying. When you look like that, not a. I mean, you have a certain stereotype about golfers. Right. right. And well, I was tennis a golf player one time. Yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but, right. Right. Amen. I don't look like it now because I'm a little bit overweight, you know, in that category. But, you know, I'm working it out. <laughs> I became, when I was 18 years old, I met this guy. I called him a Jesus freak. 
because that's all he talked about was Jesus. So I you mean, were using that kind of in a derogatory way. Yes, yes. He drove me crazy. Like he became my roommate. I was we, we shared a, a place together in college. And all he talked about was G. I mean, he's one of them. I mean, everything's Jesus, right? Everything. And I'm like, man, why? I mean, we, we couldn't even go to the grocery store to, you know, get groceries. He's witnessing to people. It's Jesus 24-7 with this guy. And he's inviting me to go to his church all the time on the weekend, you know. I'm like, I go to church. I go to my Methodist country church. I'm good, man. I got some Jesus, you know. And he's like, well, you, were you back? Well, you, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And I'm like, yeah, I got sprinkled on the head. <laughs> you know, he's like, no, I'm talking about baptism, Holy Spirit. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I got it. I got it. You know, yeah, yeah, I got that. He called it it or something. I don't know. I got that. Yeah, oh, we're good. I saw a picture of his of his sister. Who younger sister. And whoo, I said, I think I need to go to your church, brother. Come on. <laughs> God uses Holy them. Spirit or no Holy Spirit. <laughs> Ooh, get I see some of that. light. <laughs> so, yes. Jeez. Long story short, I go there, and it's a it's a it's a charismatic Pentecostal. I've never been to anything like that. Never seen anything like that. We didn't read out those red hymnal books. They got the words on the wall with the projector. They got a praise band, the drums, and all. Ooh, I'm talking rock concert compared to what I was going. It's not through. not like a wood old, old wood church with the scoreboard on the right, wall. Right, it's a it's, warehouse looking building. Yeah, this is you know, completely different. It's like whoa. And the big difference with the. Pentecostal or charismatic, those are two slightly different terms. I'm not going to define them here for this right, podcast. Right, right, right. Is going to be this, there's going to be speaking Expressive. in tongues involved. Yes. And they raise their hands. Flags, and, flags, you know, waving flags, running around. And I come from my little Methodist church where, you know, the most exciting we had is when I got stung by wasp. You know, other than that, we sit, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, preach, preach, we shake hands, we out. Well, they, they had a term like frozen chosen. <laughs> That's right. So at 18 years of age, of course, you know, I'm going through some real time changes in my life at that age, right? Very impactful time in your life, college times. Yeah. You're making decisions for your future. And this really did impact my life. I saw something that I've never been in before. I saw these people. Worshiping God in a way I've never ever seen before. They all seemed to be the same. They were just like my friend. That uh, they all were Jesus freaks to me, you know. But there was something so uniquely different about them. It drew my attention, and it drew me to go back there. You know, I started to go there on a regular basis, and they taught me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then, of course, they get the scripture, which I read in my Bible out of Acts nineteen when. Paul came to disciples, some disciples, the Bible says, and Paul asked them, have you received since you believed the Holy Spirit? Man, I'm sitting there looking at that scripture saying these are disciples. That means they're, they're saved just like I am. You know, they know Jesus. And it said, Paul asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, no, we don't even know whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now I kind of put myself in that category. I'm thinking, well, they were disciples, right? That's, this is how I read it now. And I'm thinking, well, they knew Jesus. That's what I'm thinking. I knew Jesus, but I don't know anything about this Holy Spirit person, mm -hmm. right? And I just read in Acts 19, so Acts 19, 11, 12. You can go there and read it. Paul told them about the Holy Spirit. And they said, we don't know whether there's a Holy Spirit. And then he asked them, what were you baptized? And then they say John's baptism or the baptism of water unto repentance. And Paul says, well, that's good, but you need to go on and receive the baptism of Jesus. And then I read, you know, further in the scriptures there, it says Jesus' baptism, baptism of fire. I'm thinking, that's that Holy Spirit fire. That's why everybody's so excited. And it said Paul laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They spake in tongues and prophesied. Well, that did it for me. There it is in the Bible. This is what they're telling me at this, you know, at the church I'm going to. This is what they base their belief system off of. Right? I'm all in. I mean, I'm 18 years old. I'm, I can see this in the scriptures. That's the Bible. See yeah. the Bible I am. I'm like, okay, I need it. Give it give it to me. Yeah. Right? All right, let me insert something. Come here, on. I'm, I'm going to put something in the show notes where yes. there's an episode I did. It's It's been a while. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to link you back to it to where it's about the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's from... It's an episode I did from the Life Lift book uh, where it really talks about finding your purpose and in that, I'm um, scrolling through, I really take you through every instance in the book of Acts where there is an appearance of the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, that's going to be episodes 122 and 123 and 124. I'll, I'll put them all down there just with a little note about which one is which so that you can go listen and look at the, the text that's written there. Because what he's giving you is not the only view of the Holy Spirit. It is what that Pentecostal church... There, there are five different encounters in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit's there. And they all happen in different ways, but different versions or schools of Christian thought all kind of latch onto one to the exclusion of the other. And, and kind of my point of view is like, no, they're all true. Like, let's just, everybody wants to fit God in a box, mainly their box, right. instead of saying, you know what, he could he could interact in any of these ways. Yes. And probably even some we don't see. Come on. Because in, in Acts, they're not making necessarily theology. They're just recounting what happened. Right. And, and we base some theology on that. But, okay, anyway, oh, I, I interrupted you. So I'm just make sure people could I like chase that down. I like your homework there. And I love what you're doing, sir. I see what you're doing. That's awesome. You're doing a good, you're doing a good job, young man. <laughs> That's, that is incredible. Amen. Well, see, you can tell how this impacted my life. Yeah. And how those scriptures at my time made very much sense to me. Well, and it's, it's still true. It's, like it's, it, it, it's true, but things have shifted. <laughs> I, I feel like there's even a shift in here right now. Amen. Because, you know, as you study Scripture and begin, if you are a student of the Word of God, yeah. you know, you know, God never changes, but we do change. And our understanding of the Scriptures can change, I say, as the Holy Spirit reveals these things to you, as your relationship with God develops, not only according to the living Word, who is the Spirit, but the written Word, which is written down. And so this impacted my life. They laid hands on me. I did what everybody else did. I fell out on the ground. You know, they covered me up with a blanket and I began to speak in tongues. And it impacted me. It was, it changed my life. It, it gave me a sensation of something I've never experienced before. And I started hanging out with my friend all the time. And I became a Jesus freak, just like, you know, and it impacted my life for the really the rest of my life. And so I knew at that time, even as I did as a younger boy, like when I was 12 years old, I knew I had to get saved or whatever, you know. Yeah. God, God throughout my life, looking back on it, was always drawing me into him and more clarity of him right. throughout my life, whether I was realizing it or not. He's always been with me, never leaving me, never forsaking me. And that's where we're moving into a little bit more of the grace. Right. As I did not see grace all my life until just really here recently, really recently, up until God changes me daily, daily. Well, well I think that's one of the things people need to see on this is yes. like the whole faith thing is a journey. It's not like, a oh, it's okay, a I've, I've arrived. Right. I'm here. And when you Ooh. get to something new and different, right. you know, so you move from the... Methodist thing to the Pentecostal thing. Right. It's not that the Methodist one was bad. Right. It's incredible. Right. It I, was I mean, a true. America is a Christian influenced nation. I was going to say Christian right. nation. It's, it, I mean, I don't know. That's debatable. <laughs> Christian influenced nation in large part because of Methodism. There are right. some other strands in there too, for sure. Right. But I mean, John Wesley is the guy that was pounding out Ooh. horseback riding, right? right and so. Right. You know, when you start looking at all of this, you don't you don't move to the next thing to the exclusion of the previous. Right. I mean, it's like a house. You had a foundation. You had some bricks. You had some more. You know, you get to the second story. You don't throw away the first story. Right. You're right. only at the second story because you had a first story. Continue. I mean, you know, or you got a story in a book. You're only on chapter thirteen because you had an eleven and a twelve. Come on. You only got there because you had a one. You're talking. Yeah. You're saying it. You know? Right. So. Well, so often I see people, you know, they even use this phrase now, I'm deconstructing my faith. Right. And, and sometimes I go, okay, I get it, you know, and like I've processed my past stuff and some of it I've kept and some of them go, man, that served me well during that season. But I don't get where people start being bitter in some senses by the story. It, right, right. 
it, it got you to where you are and it served you in some sense. Right. That's correct. But but there's more. Like there's you, more. you keep you keep growing. You keep continuing. And you can yes. you know, and Paul talks in Second Corinthians three eighteen about being transformed from one degree of glory, glory to glory. another as you're being right. morphed into the image of Christ. Correct. So much so he even used the analogy there. It's like looking at him is like looking in a mirror. Like you're yeah. being eased into that image. Yeah. Glory. And so, anyway, so you, you yeah. so that's what I like about the story. It's not like, well, the, you know, the <laughs> Methodist thing was the worst thing that ever happened right. to me. And even now, it's not like the Pentecostal, because I can see strands of that even now. Like you picked up the boldness that oh, Pentecostal yeah. people have. Yes. Great. Yes. I mean, why would you get rid of that and that passionate expression? Like that's. Yes, got a lot of passion. I mean, pe- well, pe- people, you know, I mean, let me just use the caricature. People in the Baptist church need some of that. Right. Passion. That. Right. But people in the Pentecostal church, they would be served well by all of the Bible knowledge that yeah. people in the Baptist church have. Just bit, using some of the strands that I know about. A little about. bit more study would help, right? Yeah, I mean, like, so... <laughs> study thyself to yeah, show thyself. Yeah, we don't have to room. be so exclusive <laughs> about all this. Sorry. So, the, so, so moving into the next chapter, the next phase is yes. grace. I say we're going to accelerate right now. Let's just accelerate and just go through some Now time. you're talking like yes. a Pentecostal <laughs> pastor. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Accelerate, aggravate. Because I did. I became, you know, I I got out of college. I I felt called to full-time ministry. I pastored a few churches, got married, went through a divorce, lost everything three or four times over. I've got the t-shirt. About your ball day. Wearing them shoes, right? (laughs) Wearing those shoes. (laughs) Thank God for grace. (laughs) Amen. Right? So, you know, I went through a a divorce and and just, you know, I understand this. God is never going to leave you nor forsake you, no yeah, matter what you're going which through. Which is probably a whole episode or co- yes. couple on that, because that that is the scarlet letter that Come on. Uh, churches do not know how to deal with. Right. Well intended. Uh, right. I think you know my experience with churches is most have been well intended by that, but they just don't know how to help people yeah. navigate through that. And as people walk through that. Um, you know, there. It sounds simplistic, but you can say yes. There is a light at the end of that tunnel. There is grace on the other side. There is redemption right. on the other side. I, I mean, I I get it. I see it. Right. You know, I, like I'm living it. You Come are on. living it. At the same time, when you're going through that, right. You, you can't see that. Well, anyway, we probably just need to do a whole another series of talks I'm on that. So we you, could go. I mean, uh, uh, unlimited time. In talking about the grace and the wonderful workings of God in all of our life, in different aspects of cultures and where we come from, I would say this. I got to a point, I went through a divorce, got a daughter, remarried, was working all the time, out of ministry, but totally miserable, totally missing. I I just felt a call, a call of God on my life. And I do believe those that are really called to preach and actually teach his word are chosen by God, that I don't choose that. And that's not meaning everybody has to do that. Well, no, it's, I mean, Ephesians 4 says that. The, he, yes. He chose some to be apostles, yes. prophets, yes. evangelists, pastors, Bible and teachers ministry. to equip the saints, to, to, to equip the rest of the people to find their purpose. Right. And those who are truly called by God to do that, they know it. And they'll be miserable until Doing they... Doing anything else. Well, but, but conversely, other people will be miserable until they find their purpose. Yes, yes. And I think one problem that we have in this day and time, everybody, you know, that starts going to church and stuff like that, they think they got to do all these things. Like to be an apostle, probably they want that title. And one thing that I've learned, I could care less about a title. If you're called by God, you don't worry about the title. It'll speak for itself. And that's really where God, you know, God teaches... I can only speak for myself, but he's taught me throughout my entire life. And he's really opened up the scriptures to me in ways that I've never really read the Bible or studied it myself. It came by revelation. If you look up the word revelation, the actual definition of a revelation is an unknown fact 
of an event or something that has actually happened that you don't know about. It's like a surprise, a gift. But it already, but it's already occurred. It's already occurred. So, and so I think, and I think that's where people get some of that wrong too, because they're thinking, "Oh, it's I've got this supernatural, right. spiritual Ooh. voodoo inside, <laughs> something that's going to happen." You're like, "Yeah, right." The okay. the revelation comes from one of the it's the gift of the the gift of grace, which is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And and we're in you know, Ephesians two, chapter eight, I'll just read the scripture says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that of your uh, that not of yourself, but it is the gift of God. Grace is the gift of God. The gift of God is the Holy Spirit. It's the promise of the Father when you really study the scripture. Grace is really the Holy Spirit that's given to you for your salvation, to understand the word of God, because no one can truly understand God without grace. And that's the Holy Spirit who reveals the word of God to you, who reveals Jesus, who reveals these things to those that are called according to his purpose and his goodwill. And it is God's good, it is, it is about his life, not about our life. Right, And those who are called and chosen by God, well, we know this. I know this personally. No one can take this away from me because I know the calling that God has placed in my life is without, the Bible says, without repentance, without reproach. It's free. It's well, it's irrevocable. He irrevocable. Doesn't, he doesn't give it and then take it away. Yank it, no, no matter what yes, you've been through. No matter what. And that's what grace is, unmerited favor. It's blessing. It's nothing you earn like the Jolly Ranchers. And I've learned this, not that I tried to learn this. He reveals this by revelation of his spirit in his aha moments. And it's totally wrecked my life, to be honest. Because when God begins, what he begins to do, he finishes it. God is faithful to his word. And he, he accomplishes what he intends to do in our life. He fulfills it. And that's, that's really who Jesus is. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of God that's guaranteed that, of the Holy Spirit that lives in our life. And it, it'll give you a different view of Jesus because God sends a word and that word does not return back to him void. It, that word accomplishes the things that God sends it to do. And God so loved the world, he gave or sent a word, Jesus, into the world to accomplish a task, a mission that God the Father sent him to do as his only begotten son. And he did fulfill the things which his father sent him to do. And that was to save the lost humanity world. And most people can't even see this. I don't care what background you come from. I don't care what religion, denomination. I don't care if you Hindu or whatever, or any other any other place. A truly called person by God, chosen by God to understand his word. Grace reveals the truth of these scriptures. And these scriptures are alive. And you are ordained literally by God, not by man. By God to preach his word with clarity to others that cannot do that. It's impossible for them to do that. It's impossible for myself to give this kind of wisdom out in my own knowledge and understanding. You would have to understand it is the Holy Spirit who does the works now, <laughs> glory, within us to reveal truth to everyone. That this is why I know I can't do anything else but live the life that has been given to me. That is the life of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit in me. Not doing my will or my things that I want in the world, but to fulfill the plan and the purpose that God has intended for me in my life today. Well, Woo! Look at the end of that verse. It's powerful. It, if yes. you keep on reading, by grace you've been saved. By faith. It talks about faith. faith. Yes. Not of your works, so no one can boast. Yes. And you keep on reading. It's like yes. one long, giant, yes. run-on sentence that for, God... Yeah. For we are His workmanship. Which the word there is art... Amen. Created in Christ Jesus to For do good works, good works yes. that he planned before time before began him, that we would walk, walk in. in. And that's everybody. Woo, that Lord. he's all of us. You know, I, I think with the whole faith element, it's something that's tangible in the real world. And what people sometimes maybe think wrongly is right. that they stole the Jolly Ranchers, they've messed up. Come on. But. All when you sin. read through the scriptures, it's all of sin, and not only all of sin, but Continue. you look at these <laughs> faith heroes, mm -hmm. 
like Paul says in Galatians 1, that God set him aside from before birth. Yes. Well, well, Paul's a guy that was killing Christians Stone in his adulthood. Yes. But God set him aside from before birth. Yes. So God knew that Paul's going to jack it up at right. some point. Yes. Like, so, in other words, God knew the divorce is coming. God knew the bankruptcy is coming. God knew the you know disillusion of the business is coming. Yes. God knew the health condition was coming. You know, God, and you, people go, well, then God must have caused it. No, 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 no. And that, like, that's getting in technicalities and start trying to figure out stuff that we can't even understand. Right. The argument here is God still has a purpose for you. Right. Even before all that clutter. Like, so Come you're on. not bad enough to derail the plans and purposes that God has for you. And people so often want to say, they want to point you back to your past. And say, well, you can't be this thing or that thing because of your past. Amen. But from God's perspective, right. everything was past and present and future potential all at once from the standpoint of eternity. And he still called and foreordained right. the great things that you would walk in. Amen. You look at the guys like David that not only <laughs> took a woman and committed adultery with her, right. but then murdered her husband. Right. And, yet, and yet he says God formed him in his mother's womb as well. Right. Spirit. Knit him together. Yes. According to Psalms. Right. You see other prophets. Come they on. say, I was set aside from the beginning of my lifetime. Okay, so th this isn't an isolated theme in scripture where Paul's just picking this up and go, oh, I was super special. Right. Well, he was, but he wasn't more super special than anybody <laughs> All else. Of us. Like Come everybody, on, I mean, like this is this is the repeating theme throughout Scripture: is that there's something, is is he super special? Yes. Right. But this is the repeating theme throughout Scripture: is that that same thing that's true of him was, Paul says, is true of you. Amen. That's right. And revelation comes to those. I, I want to say this: I believe we're in a time now of. of you know, COVID shut the world down pretty much. There's many changes taking place. There's one thing that never changes, and that's God. And God, God is spirit. And we go through many changes. And when you when you truly understand the, the word I love about grace, I used to hate grace. I hated the word grace and hope as I, as I was a preacher because I, I, I used to, uh, I believed in, the Word of Faith movement, that's another change that happened in my life where you work the Word to get God to do things for We're you. We're still working and striving, yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. And I hated somebody say, I hope so. Well, I would say, well, that's not faith if you hope so because that means you don't have enough faith to get God to do something. You know, And it's always based on what man's got to do and what we have to do to get right with God and the things we have to do to make God happy. And what we don't really understand, God's already happy with us. And he is our father. He's our creator. He's the one that's created us, even from the very beginning and even with Adam. Right. It was because of the fall in the garden that all it was it's, it's separation from God. It's the wall of separation in our own thinking, in our own in our own way. That that's what Jesus came to do. God sent Jesus into the world. To fix that problem, and he accomplished what he was sent to do. God does and not, more, and more. God fulfills his promises and his word to us, whether we do or not, and that's what needs to be seen. We are all saved by grace, which is the free gift of salvation. It's free. It's the Jolly Rancher man given to me. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I was a thief. I was. Jesus Barabbas, so I was one that was set free, got to walk off from, I was going to the, I was going to, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. God is a just God. So where there's sin, it's got to be paid for. Grace does not give you a free pass. Grace does not say, yeah, you did the sin, but you're free from it. No, that sin has to be paid. Grace gives you the spirit to understand God's ways of doing things. And because God is such a wonderful, just God, he has to be a just judge. And there has to be a death penalty for the everybody's sin. And that's what Jesus did. And we, if we can truly see this, it's the power 
of the cross of Calvary, that God became a new man. That God became God became a man, Jesus, who was all man, who fulfilled the things that man cannot do. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled every every one of those laws, it precisely in full. And no man can do that in the flesh. Only Jesus. It's only Jesus. Right. He fulfilled every law of the prophets, every spoken word about the coming Messiah. He fulfilled every single one of them. Everything he said is already it's fulfilled. And when you really do see this, and when Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection, he did exactly what he was sent to do. As John the Baptist say, he's the Lamb of God to take the sins of the world away. And God so loved the world in John 3, 16, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, who's just believeth in him and what he did. You have eternal life. It's not even based on your, if you really study it. Yeah, it's not even your faith. It's, not it's your faith. his faith. It's his faith. His he faith believed the Father as a man, just like us. Well, I think what he, people need to get from that is woo. it's not, grace doesn't mean it's free. It's not. It's definitely not. Grace free. means it's been paid for. Yeah. Well, grace is the Holy Spirit. Grace gift. is a gift. Grace is giving you a receipt. It gives you knowledge and understanding. And you get the receipt for what someone else has done for you. on your behalf. Yes. And, and that's then you Jesus move Come on, with brother. that in hand. I um, mean, we got we to sign off because we've been going like an hour. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have you back on we'll have to be. and we'll do more of the story right. and pull pieces together. Um, here's what I want to do is I sign off every time I pray for the people uh, that are listening kind of in real time yes. in real time here. And then it just kind of floats out there and it <laughs> sticks and lands when it lands. Right. right? Um, but I, I would, would love for you to go to the links in the show notes. I'll have some links where you can follow Lance online. Yeah. Um, this the is what's real funny. He goes, of, this is the voice of fire international. That's the ministry. That's the ministry. The voice of fire international on Facebook. And here's what's funny is back. He was going live. I mean, you know, I met him in a coffee shop one day. He's talking about buying a building to start a church and all this. Like, right. ah, it didn't really feel right. And then <laughs> what's funny is like, he starts preaching live on Facebook. So like Facebook preacher, and, you know, there are people that we know that kind of made fun of him. We're like, oh, you're not a real preacher. You don't even have a church building. And then COVID hits. <laughs> and we're like, well, y'all don't have a church building now either. I mean, and he, <laughs> he never was nasty to any of them. In fact, they started calling and going, how do we, how do we go live? How do, how do we go right. online? We don't know how to do this stuff. So, he, you know, help them figure out and all that. Um, <laughs> Watch but, this, brother. God, God never told us to go to a building and go to church to get saved and give our life to him. He came and gave his life for us, resurrected brand new, and lives in us so that we be the church. Well, you look in the Bible. I mean, a lot of the stuff we do on Sunday doesn't even, it's, I'm not saying it's bad. Right, right. It's just right. you can't find it. Yes. There's not a correlation to it in the scripture. Again, it doesn't on. mean we shouldn't do it. We need to gather. It just means, we're gathering. hey, the way we're doing it is a little bit not necessarily how they prescribed it in any way. All right, so you get um, that's that. All right, so let me, let me, give you all the links. I'm going to put them down in the show notes where you can follow and link on and follow him. Also, there is that 21 day challenge. And I'll tell you this, it's faith based. 21 days will email you every single day and in about five or 10 minutes, it's going to help you find balance and growth in every area of your life. Here's the deal. The faith and grace that Jesus offers you for the redeemed life <laughs> totally paid for already. In full. Um, but Ooh. then you get to walk out the experience of this and the time investment for you to invest in your family and in your finances, uh, in digging into scripture and becoming aware of what he's done on your behalf. Okay, that's not paid for. Like you you, <laughs> you get to you get to enjoy the experience of that and walk it out in real time. Um, all right, so that hopefully that makes sense how I said that. Here's the prayer. That the Lord would bless you, He'd keep you, be gracious to you, make His face a favor, shine upon you, that you would see and sense and feel His hand in your entire story as you look back so that you can be fully present and lean and live forward. May you see His hand working all things together for your growth and all things together for your good grace, peace. I'll see you again very soon.